So this talk is going to be by Peter Eckersley. He works for the EFF. He started there staring at packets, then observed SSL in the wild for a while. And now he basically moved up to layer eight and looks at the security and privacy implications of machine learning. So give him a warm welcome. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the, the strange new world that's unfolding with uh, machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, conv convolutional neural networks, these techniques that have appeared um, or, or started to be successful in the last few years at solving problems in, in AI and start asking questions about what are the security and, and privacy implications of those technologies. If, if you're a hacker who likes to break things or you want to build secure systems, um, or if we as a community want to understand the implications uh, of these new technologies, what do they look like? Uh, so I'm going to begin by breaking apart this term AI, because there's a lot of hype about AI right now. It's definitely a buzzword. Um, but there's also a, a lot of reality to go with the hype. Um, so I'm going to split things into two categories. Uh, there's this idea of narrow artificial intelligence, mostly the uh, machine learning algorithms that I was just talking about, deep learning, um, convolutional neural networks, reinforcement learning. Um, these are, are definitely learning algorithms for the most part, but you could probably also include computer chess, which is not a learning problem in narrow AI. Uh, and these are being used to solve specific problems um, by being shown examples of the solutions, and then they, the, 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 the algorithms basically make a pile of matrices that you can multiply together, um, uh, stack together, and then they, they output a very complicated formula that just happens to, to do what you wanted. Um, and so this is a, a, a fairly um, uh, old technology, in fact. It's been around for 20 years, but, but with GPUs um, and a few algorithmic advances in the last five to seven years, suddenly uh, these algorithms are solving really difficult problems. And then there's another kind of AI that people talk about, which I'm going to call artificial general intelligence, or AGI. And that's basically the stuff out of science fiction. That's where you have computers that perhaps think like humans, or think at least as flexibly as humans do, maybe in very alien ways. So it could be a very human AGI, or it could be something else like a hive mind, uh, or a, an oracle question answering machine. Like you type into Google a question, and it thinks about it a lot and gives you a very clever answer, but it's still just uh, you know, doing that rather than having its own agency. So, so those kinds of technologies are science fiction. Um, they don't look totally imminent. Um, they're, they're at least a long way off. Maybe we're making rapid progress towards them. But it's important to understand that the hype around AI blurs these two ideas together. So we're talking about real progress that uh, is rapid in this narrow AI field and a lot of speculation uh, about what AGI uh, would be, be like if it happened. Uh, and it's important to tease those apart and be clear which of them you're talking about. Um, so, starting about w w why is everyone so excited about narrow AI? Um, the answer is it's doing things that we couldn't do before. Um, this is the uh, Baidu Baike. This is the, 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 the Baidu encyclopedia that China uses instead of Wikipedia. Um, this is Google Translate uh, translating their article on privacy. And if you look um, at how good that's gotten, on the left here I have the um, the SysTran algorithm, from, uh, which was Google Translate 10 years ago. On the right, I have a, a neural algorithm that Google deployed uh, last year. And if you compare these two translations of a text in Chinese, the one on the left is basically word salad. Um, it's a lot of effort to make any sense. Of, uh, it's like deciphering uh, something from an, uh, you know, an ancient civilization to try to understand what they were talking about. The text on the right is not yet clear. It's not yet. Uh, fluent English translation, but it's starting to be something that you could read and make sense of if you needed to understand what was going on in China. Uh, here's a second example. This is um, uh, a neural algorithm, algorithm for artistic style. So what this algorithm is doing is it's being given example images on you know, the left column here. Uh, so an Escher painting or a, a Munch um, Picasso cubist painting, and it's able to extract the stylistic 
features of those source images and then apply them to a second image that you give to the, the, the network. And so here, a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, where I live, has been fed in, and you can see that it's being styled um, uh, automatically using the different style from the source images. Now, you could say, OK, this is just Photoshop filters. Uh, and indeed it is, you know, that's what a Photoshop filter is, except these Photoshop filters are being produced automatically by a neural network, given the source image. So this is a very, uh, like, new and impressive result. Here's a third example. So this is a, um, a compression algorithm made with neural networks. It's not a real compression algorithm that you can use, in, in, you know, in the real world yet. It's a, a, a basically a laboratory compression algorithm, but it's absolutely blowing JPEG away by a, an order of magnitude. So. Um, to, to, show, to show an example of what's going on here, here's a source image, um, this row. So take a look at this picture of a red stiletto. Um, here we have a JPEG image at 15 times compression um, of that stiletto. Uh, and you can see uh, all the fast Fourier transform artifacts. You can see that a JPEG image at that size is really uh, a poor reproduction. JPEG 2000. A, is a little better, but you can still see it's a very uh, imperfect reproduction. Here we have a neural network compression of the same picture at 28 times, so half the size of this JPEG, and it still looks um, like a very faithful reproduction of the original image. You can crank it further, so this is 112 times compression. It's still pr pretty good, still better than the JPEG at, at one-sixth the size. Uh, sorry, at six times the size. If you crank the neural network compression algorithm further, it looks like this. This is 224 time compression. So it's remembered that there's a red shoe. It's just forgotten that it was a stiletto. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, we're entering a strange new world where the algorithms available to us um, through these techniques uh, are doing really cool, awesome things in weird ways that are quite novel. Uh, you can also see examples here of faces. Uh, being compressed in the same way. As you crank the compression to enormously dense levels, you get something that actually still looks a little bit like the source image. It's just this slightly strange composition of abstract faces. Um, so we actually have this project that we launched at EFF um, that you might have seen uh, called the AI Progress uh, Measurement Project. Uh, you can check it out, eff.org slash AI slash metrics. And what we're doing um, is just keeping track of a bunch of different problems that people are working on uh, in machine learning and neural networks and seeing how fast uh, progress on all of those things is happening. Uh, basically, so we can track the policy implications of this stuff uh, and be aware of them in advance. To, sh to show you a few things uh, that are in that uh, project, um, ImageNet. Uh, is a widely studied uh, computer vision problem. In, in this problem, uh, algorithms are shown examples of photographs like these that are labeled with, you know, this is a leopard, this is mushrooms, this is a Dalmatian and some cherries, uh, this is a, Mad is a Madagascan cat. Um, and then after being trained on uh, hundreds of thousands of these images, the, the algorithm is given a test to see with some new, new images whether it's able to correctly identify, identify what's in them. These are images it's now never seen before. So if you look at performance on, on this test over time, in 2011, the error rate was 27%. So the algorithms were not very good at doing this. Um, in the subsequent years, you see that there's been enormous improvement. Um, there was a famous scandal where Baidu uh, had claimed to have beaten humans for the first time at this, and then they had to withdraw their result because uh, they'd been essentially peaking effectively at the, the test examples by submitting too many uh, entrants to the test. Um, but since that, uh, a number of other teams, including another team in China, um, have completely beaten humans at this task. So um, it's, algorithms now do a better job at recognizing what's in these pictures than humans do. Um, another example, uh, this is a simple reading comprehension test that uh, Facebook proposed uh, and started a, com a contest around. Um, and so uh, this involves showing the algorithm a bunch of simple logical reasoning tasks and then asking it the answer to those puzzles. So he here's an example. Sheep are afraid of wolves. Cats are afraid of dogs. Mice are afraid of cats. Gertrude is a sheep. What is Gertrude afraid of? Uh, the answer is wolves. Um, another one, the football fits in the suitcase. The suitcase fits in the cupboard. The box is smaller than the football. Will the box fit in the suitcase? Answer, yes. Will the cupboard fit in the box? Answer, no. 
So performance on this, again, we're getting to basically perfect performance, like very close to perfect performance. In this, the course here, it's not 2011. This is just two years. Since Facebook proposed this challenge, people have gotten really good at solving it. Um, Another harder example, this is an example of something that's not solved yet, is visual question answering. So here you have an image a little bit like the images from ImageNet, but instead of just being asked, is this, you know, what's in this, uh, this picture, and the answer is pizza, now the questions that are asked are freeform. So the user can ask any question they want. Uh, and there's a training and, and test data set made from Amazon Mechanical Turk workers who are shown these pictures and asked to make up questions about them. Um, and so the, you know, here there's a question, how many slices of pizza are there? And the answer would be, you know, uh, I think that's eight, but maybe not. It could actually be, it's hard to tell. Um, you can see that you have to play this game. Is this vegetarian? The answer is no. Um, uh, sorry, is, there, is this a vegetarian pizza? And the answer is no. In this one, you know, the question is, what color are her eyes? Um, brown. Uh, what is her mustache made of? The you know, answer is bananas. Um, so for visual question answering, this is a really hard problem. It requires the, the, the network to have both uh, a very good image model to see what's in the image and a good language model and the ability to merge them together. So, uh, performance on this is not yet at human levels. Um, uh, a typical human, uh, given tests like this, get, you know, will get answers around 85%. Um, algorithms at the moment, uh, neural networks are just at 66%, so a little way off from human performance. But um, that's gone up by almost 10% in a couple of years. So what are the security and privacy implications of these technologies? Uh, the first, I think, obvious and really troubling one is that mass surveillance is going to get way more effective because of these techniques. As soon as, uh, whether it's governments that have all this data, um, or private commercial tracking companies that have all this data, they aren't going to sit around and ignore these new techniques. They're going to, unless we can find a way to stop them, they're going to use neural networks to to process all of the surveillance data that they have on us and to draw inferences. It, it will be possible um, to build a system that says, predict the 100 most likely people to organize a protest in this country next week. That's not a super hard problem. It won't be done perfectly, but we should be prepared for governments to start doing things like this. Um, and until recently, learning that much about people basically required the concentrated attention of an analyst. Someone had to sit there and look at your records, look at your browsing history to, to figure out the pattern. Here, what they, all they need to do is show the computers a few hundred thousand trained examples, labeled examples, of the behavior they're interested in, and then they can process hundreds of millions of people's data. Um, and I think if we want an intuitive understanding of what this looks like, um, Facebook is probably the working example. You know, when you use Facebook, it learns an awful lot about what you're interested in, what you're planning to do, who you're interested in, um, and, you know, it's using that data uh, to suggest things to you and to try to sell things to you. We should expect more things like that uh, and more of the weird implications, you know, if, if Facebook is used by uh, political campaigns. Uh, I, I think people have claimed that both Trump and Brexit were you know, heavily backed by, by effective use of Facebook um, and, and companies that knew how to use Facebook's algorithms well. Uh, we should expect that to be the, the, the future world we're going to live in um, for everything. And Facebook's just the leader in this. Other companies are going to figure out how to do it too. Intelligence agencies are going to figure out how to do it too, unless we can prohibit them by law from doing so. Um, another huge problem we're going to have, uh, in fact, we already have, is biased um, decision making, which is both a problem in, in and of itself and then has this weird nexus to privacy. Um, so in the United States, really high stakes decisions about people, uh, like, you know, how, are you going to have to pay bail? How much, you gonna have to pay, uh, how much bail are you going to have to pay if you get arrested? Um, uh, are being made on the basis of a machine learning risk score that's produced about people. And uh, these scores turn out to be massively biased uh, according to race. If you happen to be a Caucasian American with one set of characteristics or an African American with the same characteristics, your risk score will be much higher if you're the African American. Um, and uh, 
this is a symptom of two very severe problems. One is that the source data for these systems that they're training on is itself biased. You know, if they're predicting whether someone will reoffend, they don't know the truth of that question. What they know is, uh, in their training data set, did people get arrested by the police later? Did they get convicted by the, by the justice system later? I and mean, it's been documented that both of those variables are hugely biased against people. And so if you train on biased data, you produce a prediction, a model that is equally biased. You reproduce the bias in your data. The second problem is more subtle. It's a thing called omitted variable bias. Uh, and this is a statistical problem. If you work in this area, you should go and read about it. It's a statistical problem that basically reproduces the flawed logic of prejudiced or, or, or racially biased thinking. Um, and in the abstract, what this is, is that there's a true cause for the thing you want to predict, like whether someone reoffends, but you don't have any data about the true cause. And so what you do is you find that your algorithm finds um, proxy variables that are correlated with the true cause, and one of the most useful ones is often going to be a, a, a variable like race that you want to actually protect people against. And then if you exclude race from your model, so you're not allowed to train on that, the model will find something else that's correlated with race, like a, a, where you live, a zip code in the US, a, a postal area or something, the neighborhood you're in. And then it'll use that uh, to predict the outcome, and it, it's, it's basically reproducing um, uh, race as a cause. So this may sound a little confusing and weird. I'm going to give you a, a concrete example. This is one that uh, someone actually documented um, uh, when I was at a conference about this stuff. Uh, this guy said, oh, my son had this problem. Um, where he was trying to uh, buy car insurance, or, and it, it was, uh, or pay for car insurance, and it was, it was based on a, a little device that was in the car that was actually tracking the use of the car. And he kept being uh, charged the highest possible rate for insurance. And his father called up the insurance company and said, what the hell, why, my son is a real, I, I drive in the car with him, he's a really good driver, why are you charging him the, the highest possible insurance premium? And after several hours of arguing with the insurance company, they finally said, oh, the problem is that your son drives at night. And people who drive at night a lot are dangerous drivers, um, so we charge them the highest premium. And if you, if you ask why, why is that, um, statistically it's because people who drive late at night are probably more likely to be partying and they're more likely to, to drive drunk. Um, but this guy's son was a shift worker. So he was um, driving at, at night because he worked at night, uh, which means that he's, he's basically being, being uh, judged by this category that isn't a true reflection of his uh, particular circumstances. So here, the missing variable, the omitted variable, is shift worker. If you put shift worker into the model, suddenly um, you would get a different prediction, but it's an omitted variable. Turns out the world is full of omitted variables. Most of the variables are omitted, and so when we build these models, they're inherently biased. Now, fortunately, there is some work on how to correct for these problems. Um, this is a, a, a a um, data journalism uh, uh, visualization project that Google put together about some research that you can use to correct um, a model for, say, racial bias. Um, it's an algorithm you apply to your existing model. It transforms it into one um, uh, that's essentially a model of equal opportunity. It says, what's the false positive rate for, for a protected group of people? We're going to ensure that for all of the different, say, categories of, of race, that they get the same false positive rate, which is a, a proxy for, for fair treatment. Um, uh, so if you're building models um, that need to make decisions about people, I guess my first thing is, my first piece of advice is don't do that at all. Um, secondly, uh, okay, if you really want to do that, you're going to need to figure out how to get unbiased data. You're going to need to apply these algorithms to debias uh, your predictions. Um, you're going to need to keep track of omitted vi variable bias more generally. Okay, so how does all of this intersect with privacy? It turns out privacy is one of these things like being a shift worker that's going to totally mess uh, with all of these models. The algorithms expect, uh, you know, w w when people are deploying something like a criminal justice prediction thing or something to predict your insurance premiums or whether you get a home loan, they're assuming you're going to make as much data available to the algorithm as possible. If you happen to be a privacy freak, uh, like people here at, at SHA, um, you are going to get very strange treatment from these algorithms. Um, 
For instance, I heard about one insurance company that had looked into what data they could use from social networks to inform uh, insurance decisions. And they, they basically concluded that for, for legal reasons, they couldn't look at anything except whether you uh, put a false birthday on your Facebook profile, because if you did that, that was evidence that you were not telling the truth. And people who don't tell the truth on forms are less reliable um, according to their model. Um, I think, I don't know how many people here in this room have a Facebook account? Um, how many of you who have a Facebook account have your true birthday on there? How many have a false birthday? Uh, so it's about like 60, 40, true to false. Um, in an extremely like well-educated, reliable audience, like I think people in this room probably pay back loans at, at a higher rate than the general population, but because you care about privacy, you're not gonna tell Facebook your true birthday, and yet these models are gonna use this as a proxy for unreliability. Um, so I think we're going to have some serious struggles around uh, privacy law and the regulation of these machine learning techniques. Okay, another security implication is that these algorithms uh, may be really good at finding bugs in our software. So we're seeing a test of this um, with this uh, contest that's been funded by the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. military, um, uh, through DARPA, has funded the C Cyber Grand Challenge. This is basically a contest where a bunch of AIs get to play capture the flag, uh, just hack into other people, uh, you know, other teams' computers. And I think the joke version of this is like AIs hacking into computers. What could go wrong? Um, uh, so in this game, so for, you know, fortunately it's not x86 yet. They're, they're, they're playing with a sort of restricted um, version of x86. Um, but in this game, the contestants, like any CTF uh, or like many CTFs, they get given a binary, just you know, arbitrary binary blob. It contains a vulnerability in it, um, and the contestants are searching through um, uh, essentially input space to look for inputs that cause the programs to crash or allow them to, to run arbitrary code. Uh, and, and the teams are also running the same binaries on their machines and they're trying to find ways to firewall proxy or patch those binaries so they're not vulnerable. Um, and in the early iterations of this contest, you're seeing that algorithms, at least in this restricted environment, are very good at finding a lot of bugs in, this, in those binaries. And I think the fundamental question that we as a community should ask about contests like this, which by the way are extremely cool, um, super, super awesome that you can do this, um, how does a contest like this affect the balance between offense and defense uh, in computer security? Because we know that our planet's computer infrastructure is insanely insecure. We know that's a serious problem. Um, right now it's a serious problem because of fraud and you know, getting your data compromised or whatever. But in a world with AI in it, I think it's going to be a more fundamental problem if you have intelligent beings, um, thinking beings, at some point in the future that, uh, you know, whose very existence depends on devices that are insecure um, and also that can turn around and, and break into all of our computers. Neither of those things are good. So I think we want to think about how do we get to a future where all of the devices are secure? Um, and, you know, the conventional wisdom, I think, in our community, for the most part, is the attacker always wins. If you have some balance between offense and defense, it's basically with the offense. And, you know, Bruce Schneier has this long quote about it, but the fundamental point here is there's many ways to break into a system. The attacker only needs to find one. The defender needs to find all of them and fix all of them. So I think this attacker always wins thing is probably too pessimistic. Um, maybe a more realistic way of, of phrasing this is that some attackers will always get through some of your layers of defense. Maybe if you have multiple layers of defense, you can protect um, against a breach of all of them, uh, at least you know, stacked, stacked on top of each other at, at any given time. Um, and interestingly, this kind of automated de exploit detection seems to change the equilibrium, right? If both sides, the attacker and the defender, are running a search algorithm um, uh, through e input space on the program, um, you're replacing the expensive human auditing that goes into computer security work with comparatively cheap fuzzer coverage, right? You need a good fuzzer or good heuristic algorithm, good AI for search, but, um, and then you need a bunch of CPUs or GPUs to do that work. Um, you can replace a lot of your expert um, auditing work. And in theory, that should allow the gap between offense and defense to be closed. It should actually help defenders um, 
you know, if, you're, if people trying to break into your system need to run this fuzzer, you can just run it first. The problem is we have all these devices that are never going to be covered by these protections. Um, how are we going to get uh, all of the weird Internet of Things objects uh, in this room to be fuzzed properly? How are we going to get the old versions of Android that were released years ago to be um, uh, run with the latest version of these, these security algorithms? Um, and I think the fact that we can't do that means at some point we're going to see uh, another version of the, the Morris worm that has uh, the ability to find its own new exploits. It's going to be you know, some piece of malware that launches with 10 exploits, but then once it's compromised enough computers, it starts looking at the other systems it sees on the network and finding new bugs in them. Uh, and so I'm somewhat worried about, you know, th there'll be cryptoviral malware that will be hard to stamp out because it's going to not have a finite uh, set of exploits that will keep finding new ones. So some of the people working on the CyberGround challenge um, the DARPA had proposed that the solution to this was to deploy network firewalls that would sort of automatically do the auditing in real time um, using the latest algorithms on the, the network packets. The problem with this is it's totally incompatible with our aspirations to put TLS in everything. Uh, you can't have some smart firewall box that's inspecting your traffic and stopping exploits uh, if you've got TLS, which you know you want to have. So um, I think something our community should think, of, uh, think about is whether we can put some of this automated exploit mitigation in our endpoints. Could we build something that we run on you know, every Linux box and every Internet of Things device that actually uses machine learning in real time to monitor that system, monitor the incoming network packets, and say, oh, wait a minute. I've never seen this before, but it looks like an exploit. I'm going to, like, drop this packet on the floor and alert someone, or I'm going to... I've never seen this pa pattern of um, system calls come out of this binary on my machine. This looks totally weird and different. I'm going to shut that thing down and send it off for forensic examination. I think th like this kind of version of this technology might be a way that we can really stack the, the, the odds in favor of defense, and I think people should work on this. Um, and, you know, a little hint, I think, that uh, we saw that this might be effective. Um, uh, this is the WikiLeaks documents uh, from the CIA. And what we uh, see here is a discussion about Komodo's personal firewall by the CIA agents uh, whose job it was to break into machines. And it, it, it was clear that the Komodo, um, the Komodo like, System, you know, a firewall sitting on an endpoint was really frustrating for them. Um, they got around it in the end, but they had to do a lot of work um, to make sure that their exploits and, and their, their malware wasn't getting caught by these systems that are monitoring the, the, the device. Um, and so I think if we, if we want to enhance defensive technology, um, taking this insight and automating it, and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the CIA and NSA people play both sides of this game, so I think it's a lesson for them as well. Like, hey guys, like, fund better versions of this, um, this firewall because defensive cybersecurity is the hard problem that we haven't solved yet, uh, and we need a solution to this. Um, so that's, those are a few of the examples of um, ways in which these technologies in their current form are going to just change the world. And we have to be ready for them, we have to be thinking about them, we have to be figuring out how to, to make the world safer uh, with these things around. Um, there are also some specific kinds of attacks that are possible against uh, neural networks. And I want to give people an you know, overview of a, f a few examples of, of those that have been found thus far. There are probably many more of these. And so if you're a security researcher and you're looking for interesting things to break, go and look at neural networks research. Uh, and you'll find like, a bunch of new categories of exploits that are fun to, to examine and play with. So here's one kind. These are called adversarial examples. So here, uh, this is an attack against a classifier, like the ImageNet one that I showed you before, where you, you're showing it pictures, and it's saying, oh, that's a picture of a Dalmatian and some cherries. Or in this case, this is a picture of a panda. Um, and it turns out, with, with these classifiers that do really well on these problems, so we go back here and we look at the, um, uh, where are we? We look at this. Um, uh, score history for ImageNet, and of course my uh, computer is going to take a long time to load that, so I'm going to let it do that. We see this this score history. Um, this looks like a really good classifier. 
it does better than a, um, a human at recognizing pictures of dogs and pandas. But there are certain inputs that you can make to this system, even though it does really well, that cause it to produce the wrong answer. And if we... Um, okay, am I losing my slides here? If we go back here. If we feed in the right input that looks like noise and is imperceptible to human vision, so this static field multiplied by 0 0.007, so less than 1% of the data. Basically, this is like plus or minus one pixel value in a, an eight bit, uh, one uh, bit value in an 8-bit image. The final image is no longer classified as a panda. It's classified as a, give, a given. And how is that possible? It turns out that you can just find values that go into these matrices that are the gr exact gradient from panda to given. And um, you can do this either by pulling apart the matrix and looking at the values inside it and studying it, or you can do it online. So if someone deploys a self-driving car and it has a pedestrian detection system in it, you can just buy one of the cars and walk in front of it with a few different images and see which ones it reacts to in as though there was a pedestrian present, and which ones it reacts to as though there was no pedestrian. And with maybe 50 or 100 examples, you can find a pattern that causes a pedestrian to become invisible. And so I think people are worried about, OK, will it be possible to stick a sticker on someone, and suddenly the self-driving cars will no longer be able to see them? Will it be possible to put a sticker on a building, and suddenly the self-driving car thinks it's an open road, and it'll just drive into the building? Um, uh, these things are likely to be possible unless you mitigate them. The default is this attack is present. Um, some of the mitigations that are being proposed, there's a, a project called Clever Hands that isn't a mitigation itself. It's basically a way of testing whether you did successfully mitigate um, by uh, firing these attacks against your network and then uh, scoring you on, on you, you train against the attacks and you get a little bit better. But that doesn't tell you that someone might not find a new algorithm for generating attacks that still works. Second kind of mitigation is to, instead of just classifying as panda or given, to really work hard on the problem of, of how confident am I that it's a panda or a given. If you do that, uh, at the moment, you can make the attack more expensive. It might take 10 times more um, examples before the attacker can succeed against you. But right now, um, this remains uh, fundamentally an unsolved problem. So, stuff to work on. Another example uh, of a really interesting problem to work on is reward hacking. So here, we're talking about neural networks that are um, like reinforcement learning agents. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen examples of uh, neural networks playing Atari games. Uh, I, I should probably include a demo of that. So let's, let's jump over here. Um, It turns out people have gotten uh, uh, these neural networks to play Atari really well. At first, um, they miss everything. But after a little training, they get better. Um, and after enough training, they become totally uh, unbeatable. Um, they will uh, never miss the ball and learn that they can hit the ball up the side of the of the, um, of the uh, the thing and get scores that massively um, outpace humans on all of these um, Atari games. There are maybe two Atari games, two or three Atari games left that humans are still better than machines at. But there are some really weird problems that you get along the way with these reinforcement learning agents that are going to stop us. And we say, OK, it's fine to put a reinforcement learning agent in the Atari universe, but it's not yet fine to put one in the real world. Why? Um, the problems boil down to you tell the thing to play Atari, and its aim is to maximize the score. OK, that's simple and fine, and it's safe to put that in a box. But what is the score for a house cleaning robot? Um, if you tell it, the score is how much dirt is in the room. Um, and you tell it, well, OK, how are you going to measure dirt? Well, it's the amount of dirt on your dirt sensor. Um, the agent is going to proceed to do a few crazy things 
Like one day it's going to drive really hard into the wall and it's going to break its dirt sensor and then it's going to think that it cleaned the, the apartment and so it's going to learn to always do that as fast as possible. It's going to like slam straight into the wall and break its dirt sensor. So you're going to need to figure out how to encode, oh, I want you to like always get accurate information and then maximize this variable. It's going to try things out because in order to learn in a new environment, you have to try new things. But sometimes that's going to mean crashing into your Ming vase and knocking it over and breaking it. And then the agent's going to go, whoa, that made a terrible mess. There's Ming vase pieces everywhere. I won't do that again. But you've already lost your Ming vase. Um, uh, sometimes it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn out that it was trained in a house with uh, a pet, of, you know, a cat, a dog, um, many different kinds of things, but then it meets an iguana for the first time. And it's going to try to clean the iguana. Um, uh, and you can't anticipate uh, all of these problems. So people are starting to work on uh, how to solve this. So here's another example of an Atari game uh, where you've actually got a model of the broken behavior. Um, this is from Owain Evans' work. Um, uh, so here we have this Roadrunner, it's this blue squiggle, for those of you, and the coyote chasing it, for those of you who didn't play Atari 2600 games when you were kids. Um, and uh, the Roadrunner has to dog, dodge the truck, and there are little blue uh, food dots that the Roadrunner is trying to collect. And so as the reinforcement learning agent um, uh, learns to play, it gets pretty good. You can see it's getting all the food and dodging the truck, um, staying ahead of the coyote. It's getting points. Um, but this is just level one. Uh, and when it gets to level two, it doesn't know how to play so well. So what it does is it learns to kill itself to always stay on level one. Um, so people are finding these situations, and then they're having to say, OK, how do we make Roadrunner go to level two and, and struggle to learn level two? Um, uh, these authors of this paper uh, figured out that they could use human supervision. So they actually have a human who's sitting there um, giving feedback uh, to the agent, and then they actually have a neural network that's watching the feedback and learning to predict the feedback. So, so you have this multi-stage process of um, of trying to train a, a separate network to learn not the score, but what the human would want the agent to do. Um, so this is a really interesting brand new area of research. There are like two or three papers on these problems, but I, I actually think if you go back here and look at these, these things are fundamental and hard algorithmic questions, and there's going to be a lot more than three papers uh, to be written here. I think there need to be more uh, hackers and more security people working on this stuff. Now I'm going to jump at the end to a little bit of speculation about AGI, because AGI is super fun. The science fiction AI stuff, um, where we have real, like, flexible thinking machines like us. Um, this is, you know, super fun to think about, even if it's hard to think about well. And so this comes with a giant disclaimer. Anything that I say about this topic is basically more for fun than something you should take too literally, because with futurology, your odds of being right are always not that great. But uh, interesting to think about, interesting to think about what mitigations we would have to, to put in place for some of the more uh, plausible risks. So imagine you have um, uh, a human-like AI. And I think this is a first assumption that's probably wrong. If we have AI, it's AGI, it's probably going to be very alien, very different to us. But imagine that it was like us. So about human levels of cognition, um, each AI is independent of the other, the other AIs, and it lives in a computer somewhere. If it did, it would care a lot about privacy more than humans care about privacy. Why is that? If you are a piece of software that thinks like a human, um, your memories and intentions and private thoughts um, can be copied because they're just data. They can be stolen because they are just data. They can be modified by an attacker uh, who gets access to your hardware or your code. And this can happen without your permission if some malware gets onto your machine or the permission of your owner if you're working for someone else. There's another interesting ethical question we'll have to deal with. Um, but the, focusing on privacy here, basically, for AIs of this sort, you know, crazy magic stuff is possible. Being 
having your soul stolen by someone else who makes a copy of you, puts you in a box, starts messing with you and modifying you. Um, this doesn't happen to humans, at least not in like, simple, straightforward ways, but given our current knowledge of what this technology would be like, we would expect this to be possible. This is the, you know, the likely prediction is um, AIs will have to worry about this. And so privacy for AIs will be a much higher stakes, stakes thing than it is for humans. Um, it'll be protection against having this done to you. Um, so we might want to think in advance, before we build this technology and deploy it, how to guarantee this kind of privacy that these beings would need. Uh, because if we don't do that, we build a very unstable world, right? We deploy a technology where this is possible, who knows what the hell is gonna happen next. Um, so I think we would have to think in advance, you know, what kind of hardware would we need to provide a neural network with guarantees that its data can't be copied off the board? You're running a GPU or an ASIC that has a neural network in it. Should it have some hardware security features that let you, you know, click flash and then lock the, the data in there? Um, uh, should you have uh, some, you know, I, as an EFF person, I, I'm not used to advocating for DRM, but maybe we should think about, okay, for this, you know, the stakes being this high, maybe there should be some DRM-like features where um, you can guarantee, at least locally, maybe remotely, that the copy of the thing you put on this hardware is what you originally intended, and someone hasn't broken in and put, in, put something different um, in that GPU. Um, we should also think about the political questions that un would underpin this. Like, what rights would we want to guarantee uh, to AIs? Would we want to give them a right to privacy, a right to autonomy, or the exact opposite? Would we want to try and constrain them? And uh, uh, maybe we want to give them privacy, but only once they demonstrate a certain level of maturity, right? Once you, once you have AIs that you're fairly sure have gotten past these problems, then maybe, you know, it's like you have children and teenagers for a while where you're really willing to interfere with their lives, but they get to a certain level of maturity and you say, okay, now uh, you're, you're an autonomous being, go out in the world and we, we trust you. But there'll be other questions like when do AIs get to copy themselves? When do they get to have children? Because, you know, humans, it takes like 15, 20 years to produce another copy of yourself and a lot of work. For an AI, it's just like, okay, SCP myself to a, th a million machines. Uh, so I think we're going to... If, if AGI happens, we're going to have to wrestle with these questions. Anyway, that's all I have in my slides. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions. I'm just going to leave the, uh, the caution symbol up here to remind everyone that, that this is a dangerous future. So, thank you, Peter. There are two mics open in the middle, so stand up and pose all your questions. Everyone is scared? Okay. So the, the attack techniques that you were mentioning, the defense techniques, seem still to be statistical. You're exploring a state space. How mm -hmm. familiar are you with formal verification-based attacks and defenses? Um, so formal, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with formal verification. Formal verification of neural networks is going to be tricky because they're so big, right? We're talking about enormous matrices of weights um, that have some, you know, they're often not Turing complete. Like we're just talking about a finite state machine that's enormous. And so um, formally verifying one of these things, I think that's an interesting research question, but you're up against, it's just a gigabyte of matrices and how do you, you know, how do you, get enough computational power to produce proofs about its behavior in a very, very wide range of, of situations. I do think that this whole, um, uh, the, uh, if AI raises the stakes for computer security in general, right, if we have intelligent malware that's running around breaking into things, I do think that having more formally verified systems around to begin with is a great idea. Like one of the ways we build a safer future um, kind of maybe regardless of AI, but especially because of AI, is to, to have formally verified operating systems, formally verified browsers, formally verified compilers, and, and to build our next generation of technology out of them. In the back. It uh, seems to me that uh, a lot of what you talk about is uh, still uh, uh, focusing on the physical manifestation of an AI lives in a machine. But one of the things that I've seen happening, and also with the Bitcoin phenomenon and other stuff, is that we have this large robot with humans and computers and economy and that kind of stuff going on inside each other, yeah, in one ecosystem. 
which I tend to look at like an ant hill or something like that. Uh, is research going on, because I think Facebook is trying to explode something like that, the human and the machine, making that together some sort of AI to make money. Is that something that uh, research is being done on? Well, I, uh, abs uh, I would say a little bit, right? Um, you know, I had this disclaimer slide where I said, okay, if AGI, so the, the, the kind of sci-fi AI that doesn't exist yet, was human-like, then here are some things that would follow. And I think that people who are studying this question, there's not that many people yet, um, get pretty uncomfortable with all of these weird implications. And so they're looking for ways to, to not have AGI look like this. And one of the ideas that they have that people are batting around is the idea of encouraging AGIs to rely on a human partner. So instead of having a totally autonomous AI, you have one that needs to work with a human for objectives and ethical judgment. And the idea is you'd have a kind of uh, pairing of the two together. And this is probably a really good idea. Um, and there's some precedent for it. You know, uh, people who follow computer chess would know that there are these things called centaurs that are not a, an algorithm or a human. It's a, a, a team of a computer and a human together. And centaurs are slightly better at chess than com pure computers. Um, so you could imagine, okay, let's build our AIs like they're centaurs. I think the, the tricky thing about that is it's going to be hard to know uh, it's going to be hard to stop the development of the technology at that place and not go all the way to fully autonomous. This sounds like it uh, firmly has to lean onto the law. Sorry? It seems like this is predicated on law functioning. You know, the human but or... Uh, perhaps. You know. or, or, or we might be able to think of other incentive systems. You know, we could make, the, the, we, we could make a, li a software license that says you can use this AI, but only if you have a human there. Then, then I guess the question is, you know, is that enforceable? Maybe not. I believe most of your talk depends on the question of whether we can control the intention of our machine learning algorithms. So the intention? Intention setting. Because you give it a training data, you give it a performance metric, and does this align with what we intended? But I feel like by the time that we get to actually dangerously intelligent, we probably have a good understanding of how to set intentions. Because setting intentions is actually the way we make these things intelligent in the first place. I'm actually more worried that we'll figure out how to set intentions for humans on the way there. So, look, and I think it's probably a... Yeah, and you're with the EFF, so your focus on privacy, for me it also relates to personal autonomy, being able to be sovereign, when someone knows all about you, you cannot really defend against intentions. I think that's actually two really good questions. So I'm going to ask uh, answer the second one first, which is how vulnerable are humans to essentially political manipulation? You call it intention setting, but I think we, we see Facebook doing this right now. You know, they optimizing their algorithms to make you spend as much time on Facebook as possible. and the, the results appear to be you can indeed get people to spend a lot of time on Facebook, maybe more time than they want to. Um, and they're also, uh, I guess we're seeing these tests of how effective are these algorithms at manipulating people's political views. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we have like live laboratory experiments running in all these elections right now because p political campaigns are using these techniques. Now, you know, wearing my EFF hat, I think we don't yet know um, what the answer to this problem is. Because as an organization that be believes in technological freedom, we'd have to think very carefully about passing a law that says you can't, you know, Facebook, you can't uh, uh, run certain algorithms on, on your servers. We'd need to figure out a very careful principled, uh, you know, like set of principles for what does transparency look like in this world? What does accountability look like in this world? How can uh, Facebook's users uh, have a say, be informed, and have a say in what Facebook is optimizing for? And so I think that's a question we're still grappling with. Um, and uh, people in this room should be grappling with it too. Then the, the, I think the first question you asked was about whether we can teach intentions to AIs. And I think this slide is about this. There's also a paper, if for people who are interested in this, the great starting point on this is a paper called Concrete Problems in AI Safety. Um, uh, Google that now if you're, if you're interested. It, dis it discusses these problems and sort of puts markers in the literature for other people to cite saying, 
how do we uh, go from a simple, naive description like a score in a game to something that looks more like the complicated, OK, I'm going to clean the apartment, but I'm not going to knock over the Ming vase, and I'm not going to uh, destroy my dirt center, and I'm going to understand that there are other things that are important besides just cleaning the apartment. Uh, so I think we're going to keep struggling with this. And if we solve it before AI, I think that's great. But I don't think it's a trivial problem. In the front. Yes. Uh, so on the topic of bias, um, you were talking about, uh, well, these examples of discrimination, basically, and uh, having a machine learning algorithm pulling out <coughs> sorry, irrelevant data to make decisions. Um, I guess my question is, um, should we uh, or could we try to avoid that bias entirely, given that uh, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of data to pull at, and it's going to find some way to, um, to reach a decision. Uh, and we do have some bias uh, already, like for the example of car insurance, if you're a young man, you're probably going to have a higher premium than a young, young woman. And that's a kind of bias that we, that we, are, that we are okay with. So yeah, I'm not sure that we should be totally okay with that. So. Um, and I think we're going to, like, society is going to wrestle with this question. I wouldn't be totally surprised if, especially, like, either in Europe or the United States, we started to see some regulation in this space. Uh, and that regulation is going to force us to think more clearly about racial bias than we have in the past. Like, your point about young men and car insurance is exactly right. And I think the answer is it's okay if young men, on average, get higher risk predictions because when they're put behind the wheel of a car, they drive faster and um, uh, less carefully, and they drive under circumstances that are less safe. But I think the fairness criterion here is, if you are a young man who is a safe driver, do you have the same odds of getting car insurance as a safe driver in any of the other categories? And if you're not being treated fairly in that sense, I think the algorithm is doing something wrong. Uh, it's prejudging you. This is the origin of the word prejudice. It's like prejudging you by some characteristic that's not really reflective of who you are. I have a follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, regulation. Uh, is this going to come from like some startup in San Francisco, or is it going to be maybe government regulation in Beijing? Uh, who gets to decide all this? And Great question. I mean, I, I, I think... Um, uh, some of this is coming from, um, I, I guess I was going to page over to that Google, uh, I'm not actually getting the right Google paper here. Um, the, that Google uh, infographic that shows those, those algor algorithmic mitigations for bias I guess you could say it's coming. I mean, Google's not really a startup, and it was a bunch of academics who did that work. But um, yes, I think you're getting the source of the algorithm from from a you know a fairly technical hacker community. But I think if it was going to be required by regulation, it would have to be traditional regulatory bodies that would do it. There could be some industry leadership. I guess the Partnership on AI is this uh, organization that EFF is involved in, actually, that was a, an industry association formed by DeepMind and OpenAI, um, Microsoft, Amazon. The interesting thing about that is I think there's some genuine uh, concerns amongst those companies that this technology is a little dangerous. I think it's it's not a case of them forming a regular like an industry body um, to just try and stop regulation, which is usually what industry does. I think here they're actually saying, oh, we might even need to work together on some of these problems because they're hard. Um, and so I'm for the moment cautiously optimistic that we could get a con constructive dynamic here. We'll, we'll see if that really plays out. The mic in the back. Okay. First, thank you for the presentation. Every slide made me come up with new questions, so it was really enjoyable. Um, then, a little heads up, I'm an insurance broker by trade, mm -hmm. so this kind of rang a little few bells. Um, insurance companies are an easy foe. Uh, insurance is not sexy, but is necessary, useful. Maybe you can do it without the companies, but the process of redistributing risk is socially useful. Um, the few examples you made are good triggers. I understand that at the beginning of a presentation like these, it's what makes the audience 
start thinking, but I saw massive opportunities for arbitrage there. Like, if you use the AI in such a silly way, please tell me who you are discarding, I will make a lot of money. Um, not me personally, but I'm just saying this um, description is probably more related to the state of the tech today and will self-correct quite easily. Um, the problem, I think, um, is a little different. Once you let the AI drive the whole process, the economic process, and you give it a good mission, it will probably find a good balance for the insurance. And if the mission is well described, we avoid the situations where uh, you stay at level one killing yourself, which an in insurance might become something really, really, really nasty. The point is that, like um, a question earlier about setting intention, that is extremely hard. And I think that is not only a tech problem. It becomes now a tech problem, that's interesting, but it's a problem we haven't solved in the real world. Um, let me explain what I mean. You said AIs may need to have some like human rights about being copied and uh, the right to copy themselves, etc. That is the kind of thing that we should start looking into as humans. Yeah, it was interesting at the end, you touched that point. That's the kind of decision that we have to do every day when we share information. Um, I think something was, and it's interesting, it can't, went back to insurance, was said earlier that was not correct. Um, if a 21-year-old male, on average, uh, gets a higher premium than a 21-year-old female, on average, um, that's because of statistics. It's not because because of somebody thinking why the male kills more people driving. Actually, that's not legal anymore in Europe. And the net result is that once you take away gender from the pricing, females pay more because you have to average out all the payments. So going back to the point, I need to be informed of what will happen when I share information to my premium. That's information asymmetry though, because if I'm a good driver, like you said before, I will want to tell the insurance company, monitor me. If I'm a bad driver though, and I'm not forced into disclosing this, I might be able to get a better premium just by not saying anything. So, Right, and this is the point that I was trying to make with the, the interaction between privacy and machine learning. Exactly. Right, so, so um, uh, I think that you're correct. There are a lot of opportunities for arbitrage. If you're an insurance company that wants to enter the market, all you need to do is add some more data to your data sources, and you get rid of some omitted variable bias, and suddenly you can be the insurance provider to all the shift workers, for instance. Exactly. Um, or all the young men who happen to be safe drivers. You, know, you get them to pass a, uh, you know, a few driving tests, and you realize that they're actually really Excuse safe, me. and now you give them cheap insurance. But the point there for the EFF is, how do you teach people, this is not a tech problem, it becomes one, and then you have the issue, but how do you teach people when it's in their interest to disclose information and when not? The AIs are bringing a new bias here. My long question was to get to this point. We still haven't solved the problem of individual agency. Like, how do you set intentions for humans is still a very relevant question. Uh, I don't know that I can solve the problem of individual agency in this talk. I think that oh, I, I really wanted to just point to this interesting privacy problem because um, uh, I think that people who care a lot about privacy will get caught in the same bucket as the people who don't want anyone to see how bad a driver they are. Simple question. Uh, Debiasing algorithms, do you know any efforts that are bearing open source to outside companies like Google and Facebook? Ideally with women of color or people of color and leadership. Program. Yeah, so I, the, all these algorithms are in the open literature and Google, I think, it's not that these are Google's algorithms, it's just that Google has been promoting information about them because I think they, they view that as constructive. So this is the URL I was looking for. Um, this is a, basically a, a, a data visualization project that some people at Google put together to document open academic research. Um, and what it lets you do is play with the debiasing algorithm. So it's got an actual... Um, it's got an actual data set uh, with some of these uh, omitted variable uh, problems, and you can click through and pick these different levels of mitigation and compare uh, under the different levels of mitigation how much um, accuracy 
do you lose? You lose a little bit of accuracy by debiasing, um, but then how much fairness do you get in exchange for that small hidden accuracy? So um, uh, I would recommend this uh, page as a starting point. Is this correlated research from open source efforts? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the open source approach with TensorFlow and Torch and all these libraries, do you think that there is, they're going to be like a palliative because there's no actual open data to train? So like Google, Facebook, they have massive amounts of data. So there's a subtext to this question. So the question is, um, will uh, TensorFlow and Torch, which are open source libraries, nonetheless be essentially at a disadvantage because the missing piece there is the training data? Um, and it's worth understanding that with the current generation of machine learning algorithms, you need a lot of data. Um, take however many examples a human might need uh, to learn something. These algorithms are going to need 10 or 100 times more examples to learn from because they're not as good yet. And in particular, they don't have the ability to, to generalize from previous different cases uh, to the current thing in front of them. People call this transfer learning. It's not solved. So, Right now, um, the big tech companies have a huge advantage because of all the data people have given them. Facebook has you know, all these photos and all this data from people's feeds. Google has all of Gmail and all of the search data. And so they're using that data to, to train models. Um, there is a really significant open effort as well. Um, so th those companies themselves often find it in their strategic interest to publish large data sets. You know, you see that with um, Facebook's Babby data set, uh, which I was showing the questions and answers from. Google releases data sets. Um, DeepMind releases some data. Like, all of these people do this because, you know, to help them hire, to help them point attention at problems they want solved. And universities are also running around, university teams are running around producing data sets. It's definitely to your advantage as a machine learning person to work for one of the big companies with a big set of data. What we don't yet know is what this is going to look like in 10 years. If progress in these algorithms happens, is that going to mean that data becomes more important, equally important, or less important? I think there's a fair chance it could be less important. Right? Humans don't need huge amounts of data to learn from the world. We're able to learn by walking through it. Um, and uh, the combination of that fact with the, the fact that there is a lot of open data to kickstart your models with makes me a little bit of an optimist that open data may be enough to train really good AI. Um, so. People have been making decisions for a long time. Like, you know, I'm not going to help you because you're a Samaritan. Like, you know, I'm not going to send you my catalog because you're in the wrong postcode. This was all before computers. I'm not going to rent you this car because you have the wrong last name. Um, aren't we going to be in a much better world with all of this when we have a much more anonymous way to look at things that actually matter? So that's a great point. And this is the, the main argument that people who are, say, deploying criminal justice risk scores in the United States say was, well, look, we, we may be terribly biased, but so are the humans who are making the decisions beforehand. And I think that that's a possible claim. I just think it needs to be backed with data. Like, I think if you're going to say, well, humans are biased, so these algorithms that are also biased are like, slightly less biased, I think you need to be able to say, and we measured it, and we can actually show that we were reduced bias by half. Right? If you do that, then OK, fine. That's like a, a robust argument. But I think uh, humans, uh, the whole point is that, you know, say, a, a panel making a decision about whether to grant someone parole and let them out of prison, those panels are actually made up of people who are really good at judging the character and behavior of other people. Like, that's what they spend their time doing. And humans are not that bad at it um, if, if we train for it. So. I'm not, I mean, and yes, the results will be biased, but I think um, maybe less biased in some cases. Um, uh, and I think there's also a really good corollary there, which is you can probably detect which humans are doing a really good job of that task and which humans are, are leaning on bias as a, predict, as a prediction um, tool uh, and start to encourage the humans to do a better job if you, if you use data. Um, so I'm just mindful of the time. I think th there's another talk starting here. Um, should we break? And I'm, we can, is there a space where we can keep chatting if people have more questions? Yes. I can, like Explodey, for example, or uh, some one of the workshop tents. So any more questions? No? Then a final round of applause for Peter.